Okay. Um, so I have to say the reason I'm, I was very glad to get this invitation is because I, I work for the Royal African Society and one of the projects that we're engaged in is a site called Gateway for Africa, which uh, Janelle mentioned. And one of the objectives of this site is to, kind of, is to deepen the awareness of Africa-related events and culture um, that happen wherever they're happening in the globe. And I think culture to me is an aspect of society that is often celebrated but not often invested in. Um, so it's very, it's very important to us that we're, we're here. Um, I was told that when you do a talk on cultural diplomacy, you have to start with a quote from Joseph Nye, um, the American academic who actually defined the idea of soft power. Um, and obviously his definition of it was that it's the ability to persuade through culture, values, and ideas, as opposed to hard power, which conquers or coerces through military might, or economic might, we might actually add. Um, but for the few minutes I speak to you, I don't really want to talk as an expert per se, but more a participant observer. And the things I want to talk about are the potential and opportunity for the digital world in a globe where power is more diffuse, where it's more unpredictable, and perhaps for those able to control it, it's certainly more malleable than ever before. Um, but I would want to define my position in saying that, as I've mentioned already, I work with the Royal African Society. My interest lifelong has been as a sort of student of African politics and history and culture. Um, and I'm currently working in an organization which has the head of the Commonwealth, the Queen, as its patron. So that kind of informs where I come from. Um, so I'm, of course, very interested in countries and people who take an approach to culture that see it as more than an instrument of development and certainly see it as a crucial weapon of influence. So even though I think this point of view is acknowledged in many places, I don't actually think it's strongly utilized by organizations and governments the world over. Um, and even where it is being done, I would say that there is a very key area that is relatively untapped in this area of cultural work and diplomacy. And that's the space I want to touch on today. It's the digital space. Um, I think what we have to comprehend is that there is a new continent in the world, and it's called the internet. Its countries have names like Facebook, Google, YouTube, and Vimeo. The only passport you need to be a citizen of this country is an internet connection and the ability to use your thumb. Unlike the hard physical continents of the world, this continent is an open space that provides a flatter opportunity for organizations and people, especially probably smaller organizations and countries, to exert cultural and social power. It gives us identities that are not fixed in one location, but ties us to communities of exchange that are everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Recently, I was watching, uh, I was, actually, I wasn't watching something, I was Googling, and um, I was struck by something I found from a writer called Taya Selassie, who is a Nigerian, Ghanaian, British writer, um, who was presenting at an event called TED, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of, the TED conferences. And she was speaking about the topic of nationality, and it seemed to encapsulate to me her words, how many people feel about their existence in a world where the community they can connect to can be 6,000 miles away, but it's actually also available at a click of a mouse. She asked, how can I come from a nation? How can a human being come from a concept? History is real, and cultures are real, but countries are invented. Now, I know that may give the diplomats in the, in the audience a shudder, but it's the very real feeling that many people have. Increasingly, I think our ties to nation, to countries, are very fragile and can be easily be broken. So she suggests three ideas that are maybe more helpful. Rituals, relationships, and restrictions. And all three of these have profound power for cultural diplomacy in a digital world. We can engage in digital rituals and relationships wherever we are in the world, with less restrictions than we can in the physical world. Yes, there is a cautionary note to be sounded in that your ability to access the digital world can be constrained by your access to electricity, your education, your ability to read, or your access to enabling technology. But in at least one of these, in terms of enabling technology, I think we can say that in recent years we have seen a radical transformation 
through the telecommunications revolution that has swept through the world in the past 20 years. For two generations, we've had a world which is digital in which this new continent exists. Yet, it's a world that can seem bewildering to many people who were born into a very analog world. But this space is where 21st century perceptions are being formed. It's um, a place where the young and old are experiencing the world in a radically new way. And it's a place where the world is in your hand through a very small device, a mobile phone, a very powerful piece of technology. Um, and the power of mobile and technology to transform the world can be illustrated through a couple of examples. A few years ago, during the recent Kenyan uh, elections, CNN, the international broadcaster, sent out a story which misrepresented a very small incident. So it was sort of some people fooling around with guns in Nairobi, I think. And they suggested that this showed that the nation, Kenya, was in chaos. It was in a uh, violent meltdown. And very quickly, Kenyans were able to respond on Twitter that this wasn't the case, that it was a very localized incident of violence. And it spawned a hashtag. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with Twitter, but this uh, hashtag was called Someone Tell CNN. And this was, it sort of became a very big topic and it started trending globally um, within, I think, 24 hours. So someone tells CNN, essentially, this Twitter action, which is essentially just people in Kenya responding to things on their phones in the mode of a 140-word telegram, um, made CNN, the world's, one of the world's largest broadcasters, pull their story and apologize. So it gives a relatively disempowered group of people, possibly Kenyans in, in the media space, the ability to criticize a very big, powerful global organ. And I think that's a very new thing in the world and has wide implications for how we relate interculturally. Of course, the most more recent example of that is the unfortunate incidents in Nigeria where over 200 girls have been kidnapped and we have the Bring Back Our Girls campaign, which started as a hashtag on Twitter, but also has a physical manifestation now in that there's a protest outside the Nigerian uh, 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 president's house not President's House, but a, a square in, in Abuja every day, literally. So the digital also moves into the physical world, and I think we should bear that in mind when we think about diplomacy. Um, a little further from home, in recent months, we've witnessed ISIS's, uh, the Islamic State's very powerful use of social media to talk about um, their aggressive terrorist actions. It's a terrifying example, but it's also a very strong example of how a relatively small and, in the global sense, weak organization can exert amazing power over the world. On a more peaceable note, eight years ago or, or less, the election of the United States' first African-American president was widely credited to the impact of social media. Now, I'm giving these examples just as an instance of digital power, and most of them in Africa, most of the examples I've given are an example of what I call negative correction. So that's people essentially correcting fallacious or erroneous perceptions of their country, their continent, through social media. But um, I wonder what can be done if we can marshal this kind of force for culture, and if we can ma mass marshal the force for wider acts of diplomacy. Recently, I, I heard the government of Somalia had to close down nine of its embassies because it couldn't afford to open them. But in the 21st century, shouldn't we be asking the question, why does an embassy or even any cultural institution have to be located in the physical region that it is addressing? If your country can be a website, what's the problem? Um, so I think if, for example, you paid a visit to the British Museum, you would find artifacts from all over the Commonwealth. Now, there are many controversies about many of those artifacts. Um, I'm not going to touch on any of them here, but I think we can actually talk about, and I, bear with me, I'm going to link these two things in there. We can speak of, in many of the countries where these artifacts are from, a sense of cultural deprivation. If a lot of your history and your culture is preserved in artifacts and objects, which are not necessarily in the physical locations where they used to be, um, how do you relate to your culture? And how do the countries that now possess these objects relate to you? So if we can talk about cultural deprivation in that sense, and speak of it as a very real thing, just as pressing as the needs of material deprivation,
we should ask how we could address those issues of cultural deprivation through the new tools of the digital age. And bear in mind, I'm not just talking about the so-called poor countries. I think there's a lot of cultural deprivation here in the UK as well, where many people seem very unaware of the history that's produced the Commonwealth and the melting pot that is the city of London. Um, increasingly, of course, we get asked, what's the point of the Commonwealth in a world with many multilateral organizations? If you have the United Nations, the World Bank, the African Union, ASEAN, the BRICS Bank, NATO, the list goes on ad nauseum. Why do you need an organization that essentially is bound by empire? But I think what's striking about all these organizations that I've named is that their preeminent focus really is on two types of power, economic and military power. And of course, each has a space for culture, but in a way that I think is very distinct from the Commonwealth. It seems to me that if the Commonwealth is to exert any influence within itself and also outside onto the rest of the world in the 21st century, it will first and foremost to be through the medium of culture, and that in the broadest sense. I think marshalling the opportunities in digital spaces will be very crucial to exerting this influence. Um, or should I say, yes, it will be very crucial. And we have to ask how would one marshal this force um, in uh, agglomeration of countries that I've said are brought together by a shared history that includes both brutality and mutuality. An organization that includes both the empire nation and the many fragments from the death of that empire. An organization that is bound by a common language but also of values. How do you make digital tools, relationships, and rituals relevant for such an entity? I certainly am not going to pretend that I have the answers, but I think it's crucial to ask that question. So where are the opportunities? I think there are a few things to mention. In an increasingly globalized world, the Commonwealth has, of course, the advantage of language. English remains the preeminent global language. As an association that values this language, we should be translating that value into digital opportunities. But before we float into a world of digital envoys and data, firstly, it has to be said that, of course, a digital world cannot thrive without robust infrastructure in the real and physical world. The internet is virtual, but it's also a physical thing of undersea cables, data centers, and space powered crucially by electricity. So, and electricity, of course, means infrastructure. So there can't be any investments in the digital world that does not lead back to the issues of development. So, which is just to say that if we're talking about culture, we're ultimately also talking about development. Now, assuming that infrastructure and access to digital technology continues to improve, we need to support the development of positive digital cultures and mode of exchange. And I think in doing that, what we should be looking at is how the Commonwealth can relate to itself, but also beyond itself can also relate to the global Commonwealth of Nations. And for me, supporting digital cultures means, yes, more tangible resources and awareness of the power of digital as a key plank of the Commonwealth's work in promoting values of diversity, democracy, and human rights. And when I say resources, I do mean money. Um, in preparing for this talk, I learned about an institution called the Virtual University of Small Commonwealth States. It's pronounced VISOC. Um, but I was actually perplexed to read in the description of this thing that the Virtual University of Small Commonwealth States is not a tertiary institution. It's actually a framework for creating educational materials which are then used within educational institutions in Commonwealth states. I think you could also create a virtual university, which would be an amazing thing. Um, but delving into the, deeper into the project, I came across this statement which was sent by, I think, two of the leading officers um, within the Commonwealth of Learning, which is obviously a project that's part of the Commonwealth. And they're Sir John Daniel and Paul West. And this was their note to the senior officials meeting on transnational qualifications framework in 2008. And this is what they said. So they said, a spin-off from VISOC, which we have found impressive and touching, is the cross-cultural friendships and understandings that have been generated. Educators from small states do not often get opportunities to visit small states on the other side of the world. They seem to find it immensely enriching to meet people from a range of cultures and backgrounds who all have in common the experience of living in a small state, whether one surrounded by ocean 
or one surrounded by other bigger countries. So the virtual university for small states of the Commonwealth is beginning to have some real impact and is generating a sense of cohesion amongst the participating states. Only a few years ago, the idea of having 30 small states collaborating online to develop and share course material for their tertiary institutions would have been a fantasy, but today we have begun to do it. I felt it was important to share that quote because I think what I'm talking about is something that the Commonwealth is already doing, and, some, and so what we need to focus on is how more of this can be done. How do we expand into other areas of culture? And it brings me back ultimately to my own work and my own awareness of the Commonwealth. Recently at the Royal African Society, we've had the privilege of being involved in a project called Af Africa 39. And it's a collaboration between a very large festival here in the UK called the Hay Festival and the Commonwealth Writers Programme. Uh, it highlights 40 of the best African writers under 40. Um, and that project led me to another aspect of the Commonwealth's work, which is um, part of the Commonwealth Writers Programme's work, which is a series of podcasts from writers all across the, the Commonwealth. And what they do is this small project, it's called 10 by 10, they interview 10 writers and over the, from different parts of the continent. And it's a very small part of the work. It's a very small digital thing, but it doesn't acquire, take a lot of resources. But it, it would be amazing the impact that those kind of projects have. Um, for me, I think it's very definitive and, and crucial aspect of what we do in the 21st century, how we relate. I think we don't often think about, I think we take the digital space for granted. I think people assume that you, know, you have a website, but if you, or you, you have a Twitter account, etc. But actually, if you think about what that means, it's a very profound thing to be able to say, actually, you can find me anywhere in the world. How do you use that opportunity to expand the way that people view your, your, your country? I think there's a, there's a very key opportunity for particularly smaller organizations and smaller groups who might not have the impact in the wider world um, if they're doing something large, might never be able to do something like the Fulbright Scholarship. But what is the, um, I suppose there probably is a less of a cost if you're creating something like a digital scholarship. I mean, I think that, I'm just going off on a tangent here, but I think that there are lots of things that we can imagine that we can create that don't require us creating spaces in the physical world and that we can make possible for, um, for spaces where we make new connections, particularly, I was just speaking to the High Commissioner about the relationship between Trinidad and Tobago and Nigeria. There's a very, very deep and intense relationship happening between what they call the South, South, and much of that goes under the radar. Nobody is aware of it. And I think if we seize the digital opportunities that allow us to talk about these relationships, um, we might be able to start making a huge impact on the world and actually changing it from one where people necessarily see culture as something that has to be done in a big physical exchange. It could all be in your computer and in your mind. So thank you.